yeah. Oh, we're doing this for real this time. And I'm so excited to bring Alluvium Zero to everyone. Let's go ahead and pull up the gameplay so everybody can see this beautiful game. What we're seeing right here is Alluvium Zero. This is a developer build that we're bringing to you guys where we've juiced out the resources and the buildings and everything just so we can demo all of the gameplay and all of the features in this live developer walkthrough. And it wouldn't be complete with just me, your host and executive producer, Andrew Wall. Of course, we need to have the super geniuses that were behind creating Alluvium Zero, starting with Dimitri, our senior art director. Dimitri, welcome to Alluvium Insider. Hey, I'm back again. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. And of course, an event like this would not be complete without the man behind the game, the game director, the CTO, the vice president of Galactic City Builder Games, Johnny in the house. What's up, Johnny? Howdy, Andrew. Good to be here, mate. Totally real title. Uh, can you guys guess which of those titles were real? So, Johnny, for those out there that are excited about the alpha or just hearing about Alluvium Zero for the first time, in a nutshell, what is Alluvium Zero? So Alluvium Zero is a city building game. Basically, the idea is to build up your industrial complex or your factory to produce resources that are used throughout the Alluvium universe. Uh, the most important of those resources is fuel, which is the, the in-game currency used in all of our games. Uh, but there's also other, other resources like NFTs uh, for blueprints, which allow you to create skins and so on. For those not at all familiar with the genre, some comparisons, some games that it's similar to might be things like uh, Clash of Clans, Simpsons Tapped Out, uh, maybe uh, Farmville, those kind of games where you, know, you build things up, you click, you wait, uh, and you slowly advance and progress your, your, uh, your land or your, your structures. That makes sense. So let's go over and just show everybody what we're talking about with each of these things. So the fuel is up here at the top of the screen. So you're looking at Krypton, you're looking at Hyperion, and you're looking at Solon with those. And then the scanning for blueprints aspect, I started testing that earlier. And I know everybody's excited about scanning for blueprints. You're gonna be using this structure, right? The Singularity Scanner. Can you tell us a little bit about blueprint scanning and why that matters and why the community is talking about it so much. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's actually a couple of structures involved in this, this process. Uh, the, the start of the process is uh, scanning alluvial bio data. So basically you're sending out signals or scanning across your land, looking for these alluvials. And when you find them, you're capturing their bio data. Uh, so you can store it in your data banks. That's what the singularity scanner building does and we can see you've already scanned the bio data of Tiru over there. There it is. Uh, yep. It allows you to then display it for all to see. Uh, the second step of, of getting a blueprint is research where you use your materials lab to investigate, research the bio data you've found. And if you're lucky, you may discover a, a blueprint and that blueprint will allow you to create skinned items in the game, which you know, can really allow you to customize your, your avatar uh, you know, and, and your items to reflect you know, the alluvials you love and, and the person that you are. Well, help me understand that, Dimitri. So I'm, I scan this, maybe I get that blueprint. What are some of those aesthetics like? Uh, can you help everybody understand what may, what may be in store for folks if they do successfully execute that research? Oh, yeah. Well, basically, as Johnny said, like uh, researching that will give you an option to have a blueprint of the skins, uh, like diff different skins, sorry. Uh, and those different skins will be connected to your main game in the Illuvium that you can develop like your Ranger skin, your Mozart skin, and uh, so on. And you'll wear them and shine the beauty. Got it. Okay, cool. So, I mean, those are some of the basic, the reason why I wanted to cover fuel and blueprints, that's what a lot of people are going to be going after, right? Those are the highly sought after resources here on Alluvium land. But speaking of land, we're on a plot of land right now here in Crimson Waste. So Johnny, who can get access and what are those access requirements 
for people to be able to play Alluvium Zero at all and in the alpha stage. Yeah, so unlike our other private betas, the alpha doesn't have any specific invite requirements. So you don't need to be accepted into the, the beta or the alpha in this case. What you do need to do is own a land plot. So anyone who has at least one plot of land uh, sitting on their wallet can download the game and, and start playing on that plot of land. Uh, specifically, you do need to create an account uh, at play.alluvium.io. You need to attach your wallet and the address that holds your land plots. Uh, and after you've done that, you'll be able to download the game. When you log into the game using that account, any land plots that are held in that address will, will appear and you'll be able to select which plot you'd like to play on. That makes sense. I experienced that today here on the test net, which is where this dev build is. And let's talk about the land and the different regions. Here we're in Crimson Waste, which Johnny, you were saying before the stream, this is your favorite region uh, in terms of the look and Alluvium Zero. Why? Why is this your favorite? Tell me. I mean, the art is, is really beautiful across all the regions. I, I do definitely seesaw between this uh, region and Crystal Shores, but I don't know, maybe there's something about uh, the color orange, just the kind of the, the burnt out kind of deserty kind of look. I don't know if I just find it really appealing and I find myself when I'm testing, you know, spending most of my time here and quite a bit of time on Crystal Shore as well, just because it, it also looks amazingly beautiful, as do all the other the other regions. Yeah, let's not insult the other regions, Johnny. So, Dimitri, what goes into, you know, everybody everybody's now experiencing the obviously the private uh, a private beta uh, for Arena, and then they're ex able to experience private beta for Overworld. Um, but those regions and those looks and those assets need to be translated here into Alluvium Zero, our kind of third game, if you will. So what what is the process? What goes into taking what people see in the Overworld and Crimson Waste, for example, folks that are playing Overworld right now, and then bring that region to life here? in a mobile style city builder game? That's that's a good question. And remember like how Grant uh, forced everyone to do a lot of rocks. So like you see a lot of rocks in this region. Ah, I can see some down here. Out. Yeah, so, <laughs> there's some rocks. Exactly, so like rocks never going anywhere from this game. But basically what we're doing, uh, we're creating all the assets for our main game we're living, right? Like, yeah. And we can easily take those assets because they are high risk enough we can use exactly the same textures with the bit of the displacement for the offline rendering. And we can, you know, create this beauty environment that is almost translates the look and feel of the main game one to one back to the Living Zero. This was our main goal when we started uh, uplifting the uh, graphics. We wanted everyone to experience different regions, different look and feel, different mood similar to what we're doing in the main game. That makes sense. So let me just go ahead and show folks that are curious. This is a, once again, if you're just tuning, this is a, as you can see, I have this cheat menu here. <laughs> so I can just change my region. You will not be able to. Your land is on the region it's on. But uh, what region is this, Dimitri? This is House and Sea. So you'll see a lot of salt pools and you'll see them in the main game as well. So like a lot of assets that you see in, uh, in the, what you're seeing, are uh, being like translated seamlessly from the overworld. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. I love the bright colors. It's like being underwater, but above ground. And so if folks wanted to have this look and this land, they would need to go to the Aluvidex and purchase something in Halcyon Sea. Let's just quickly show the other regions. There's so many gameplay mechanics I want to go through, but uh, what region is this? Exactly. Look at this icy tiger boreal, right? Like everyone is in the snow, like in a winter time at the moment, except Australia, I believe. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if you're in Australia, yeah. It depends on what part of the world you're in. Maybe you could buy two plots or something and then uh, switch, depending on if you want to go on vacation or not. But yeah, the beautiful, as you guys can see, the buildings contrast significantly and in different ways off of the different regions and they look uh, uh, very unique. Let me just show a couple more yeah. regions here to everyone and then we're gonna get into these gameplay mechanics. Wow. Holy pinks and purples, Batman. What region are we in? 
This one is Jordi's second favorite uh, region, I believe. Christian Shaw. Yeah, some some days it's my first favorite. All <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> well, here we go. And Crystal Shaw, like all, everything is crystallized, similar to again, like I'm linking going back to the overworld because this is this is the main connection what we built here. We're gonna see all these assets in the in the main game as well. Yeah, what an upgrade! Um, obviously, we 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 saw footage um, about a year ago or so from like a pre-alpha build, and. Now the look here is just, it looks very Alluvium, right? It's its up to par with the aesthetic and the standard that we've set with Arena and Overworld. So were all of these assets that we're seeing here from the texturing on the ground to the plants to the background and everything, were those all recreated from scratch or was it more of an upgrade from the previous build? Just curious to know Some the of, kind of work you guys put in. Yeah, like, look, some of the, because we're still in the progress of building some of the regions. So, like, uh, Crystal Shaw and the Sharp Love being the last region to upgrade the background for the IZ, because, like, we didn't have enough of the assets ready for the uh, overall. And, like, basically, we needed to put some, some more attention into those assets, grab them, make them for the main game, and take them into the Illumin Zero. Um, and in the process, it goes again like similar similar to every other pipeline. It goes from the concept part. We do create a concept part of the different assets, different look and feel of the uh, different regions, and we create those assets, model them, texture them, do low poly, do all the all kind of sorts of baking and you know background stuff that all CGI artists do. And here we go, like we're gonna have a final asset that's can be used and rendered in a super big resolution because all the love being put up front. I see the comments in chat right now saying, it's glad it's worth the wait. People want their land to look amazing, right? If they're gonna be, and, and it was interesting during the land sale and Johnny is kind of showing us that to us here in the stream. He's got his first favorite and his second favorite. People just kind of fall in love with these regions and they just want the land just cause it's a cool collectible. So I think the team's done a great job. Really quick, what region is this for those that are not familiar with this lush uh, greenery? This one is uh, Basil Basin. Very, very swampy, very, very dumpy look, you know? It's, 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 uh, I, I, I like it. I like this one, I think, the best compared, compared to the others. This kind of gives a uh, very uncomfortable feeling. Uncomfortable is good and it's kind of baked into a lot of the alluvium games there's always something i feel like in the soundtrack and the look there's always some mystery mm. something waiting around yeah. the corner is sort of the feel of uh, all of our alluvium experiences but this one much brighter i saw folks requesting in chat where's brightland steppy steps here it is my friends and here we go yes and you see we, we had an upgrade already for the for this background so like uh, this one mm -hmm. was one of the first background that we've done for the ic and it become like after reviewing all seven in the game, we found that this one is a little bit simple. So we went in and added more assets that's been created by the uh, by our outsource studio and our internal team. And now it it is in line with the with the other regions as well. Got but it. So this is I the quality say, bar. This is the quality bar exactly. we're looking to hit. And so if folks see backgrounds that are quite up to that quality bar, we're working on it uh, to, to get it there. 100%, 100%. Like we, we're always gonna go only forward from this point on. And not only that, like right now, we only got one version of each background in the game, but like we are planning already ahead and started building some variations. So like you will be maybe lucky enough to get some more unique version, unique look that uh, not many people, not many other people have. Interesting. Okay, that's interesting. Here's Johnny's least favorite, evidently. Johnny, what you got against Shard Bluff? I don't know. It's just too dark for me, I guess. Too hot. It's too hot. It's too hot. He can't, he's got to get out of the Gus kitchen. The heat, get out of the kitchen. <laughs> Gosh, we're both so old. Yep, we, same, same joke. Yep, indeed. <laughs> Wanted to show this one because the looks here, just like in the overworld, the looks of each of the regions here in Alluvium Zero feel completely different and give you a different feeling as you're scrolling through it. So just imagine you can play this on PC, Mac, obviously Android, to hold this in your hand or to play it on a big, beautiful 2K or 4K monitor like I am right now. 
Um, the aesthetic is strong and it gives you a, a unique feeling. This isn't just some ice cold logical city you're building here. It, you, you know, it's got that collectible feeling that you can fall in love with. But look, we got to get it back to the region. Oof, that's Johnny approved. Thank you for sharing that insight, by the way, Dimitri. Really appreciate it. Let's move forward with talking about some of the uh, game mechanics now that everybody's seen the regions. So there's lots of different stuff here when you uh, open up your land for the first time. Uh, there's resource sites, there's landmarks. Can you walk us through each of these glowy things, Johnny? What are they and why do they matter? Sure. So each land plot, which is an NFT, has a number of sites on it. Uh, the number of sites depends on the tier of the land plot that you bought, but basically these are your gateway into acquiring resources inside the game. Um, and then you know, eventually uh, selling those resources to the pool for Ethan and so on. Or so, using them for yourself. So you could, oh, absolutely, you could absolutely. choose to use them to do various activities in the other games. So for example, if I, if I acquired fuel on my land here, Johnny, what could I do with that fuel outside of selling it on the Iluvidex? So depending on which, which kind of fuel you use, I mean, effectively every in-game action in all of our games will, uh, that has a cost, will have a cost that's measured in fuel. Uh, so for example, anyone playing the overworld may have noticed they're spending Kryptons, uh, obviously in the, the beta, it's, uh, virtual Kryptons, uh, but that's, that's used when you, for example, travel between regions, um, you can find or collect the Hyperion fuel, which you use to, uh, cure your shards. You can collect the Solon fuel that's used in crafting so if you want to for example make the skins that we were talking about earlier you would you would also need some some soul on to fuel that uh, crafting process got it so the, that's the interoperability part that we keep talking about that term is so long it's so inside baseball in the crypto industry but or in the blockchain industry whatever we want to call it but this fuel not only can be sold on the Iluvidex, but it can also it has real utility in our other games that helps you unlock experiences in those games and essentially unlock new levels of gameplay and strategy, which is really, really cool. I love that we have given players that choice where they can, um, you know, something like magic cards, right? You can play with your magic cards. You can build different decks with them. You could sell. You could trade them back at the shop. You can do what you want with it. That has yet to hit the video game industry until now. And the centerpiece of that in Alluvium is land and is Alluvium Zero, which makes this game so exciting. So that's really cool. So we had, you mentioned each plot of land, you know, it may have different uh, resource sites, um, but they also have landmarks up at the higher tiers. Can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, we have landmarks on on this. So what 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 is entailed with these landmarks? So landmarks, were really a way to give a little bit of flavor to different land plots within the same tier. Basically what a, a, la a landmark does is it's associated with one of the resources. If you're on a tier three plot, it's associated with one of the elements. If you're on a tier four plot, it's associated with one of the fuels. And that association basically means that your land plot is better at generating um, fuel or elements of the associated type. So, uh, you know, I think we've got the, the halogenic geode there, which I think is, is tied to silicon. Yes. Um, that's going to mean that when you extract silicon, your efficiency is, is boosted, but probably more important, the efficiency cap is also higher. So let's say that if you extract some silicon, at a hundred percent efficiency, you might get 10 silicon. If you extract at 150% efficiency, you might get 15 silicon. But by having this landmark, you can now get your efficiency above 150% all the way up to 175%, um, which means that you're going to get uh, 17 uh, silicon per harvest, or if, if, you know, if you're harvesting 100 at 100% efficiency, you'll get 175. So 
it's not a huge boost. The idea is not to make you know one plot ex you know a significantly better than the other at the same tier, but it's enough to be important and it affects the optimal strategy for building out your land, um, trying to align the things that you're you're doing, the the resources you're extracting with the um, landmark that you have on your plot. I, I mean, I, that makes perfect sense to me. We don't want land to be samey. We want the land to be unique and to have its own strategic um, uh, L aspects. And so in, exactly. this, in this case, and, silicon, and you know, you can you can sort by resource here by checking this button in the bottom right. And you can see your various buildings or, or sites on your land where you can potentially uh, focus on silicon as a part of your strategy. And so that's a deep strategic consideration when people are buying land, selling land, or coming up with what their game plan is on their land in Alluvium Zero, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head and, and in the sense that we don't want things to be the same. We want each person to have to look at their plot, look at the positions of the different sites, look at the relationships between the landmark and the site, and work out what's the most efficient way, what's the most effective way to use this particular land plot to maximize your game. Whether you're interested in, in blueprints and research or whether you're interested in, in fuel production, you need to assess your land and, and come up with you know, the best strategy for that specific plot. Got it. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. So let's move forward then. So I've been as everyone has seen, I've been upgrading structures and even building some new ones. And there's a ton of different structures here and a ton of different opportunities for people to make choices on what they're going to build in Alluvium Zero. So I'm going to pull up the build menu, Johnny, and here under structures. And we've got basics, extractors, converters, storage, science, others. When you first arrive in the game, you're like, holy moly, so many options, so many strategic decisions. Can you help us understand, starting with basics, what do each of these categories of structures mean uh, relative to each other? Yeah, absolutely. So the basic structures are kind of the structures that you need to be able to build other things. So the nexus is always the first thing that you build. Uh, the, the engineering workshop is the second thing that you build and it starts unlocking the, the tech tree, which allows you to build all of these other kind of buildings. Got when it. You want to so, get so the Nexus the is this giant structures. building here in the center. Yep. This is sort of your centerpiece building. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's the first building you build. So um, does the placement of the Nexus matter? Only at the sort of fine level of detail where you're really trying to optimize efficiency. Uh, so it's not the efficiency of the Nexus itself that matters, but the space that it's consuming is space where you can't put other things. So ah. if you wanted to move move all of your converters close to the associated resource sites, you may have to put your nexus in one corner or the other or in the center. So again, it's that whole idea where each plot is a little bit different. Uh, but the nexus itself doesn't have any efficiency related effect. Just want, Sorry to cut off your train of thought there. Just wanted to clarify that since that's the first building everyone will be interacting with, that in the engineering workshop. But as we move through the rest of the basics, Tell us about um, Quantum Fabricant and Power Station. Yeah, so the, the Quantum Fabricant, much like the Engineering Workshop, unlocks a, a significant sort of branch of the tech tree, but it's for the more advanced structures where we're talking about collecting fuel, we're talking about scanning and research and, and so on. Got uh, it. Yep, and finally, in the, the Basics tab, the Power Station, that's really just a way to power up your buildings Effectively, powering up means it increase, increasing efficiency. So you'll likely have quite a lot of power stations dotted throughout your land plot in order to boost the efficiency of your converters and your extractors as much as possible. Oh, let's do that later in the stream then, Johnny, because the as everyone who knows anything about Alluvium Zero can see, my land is not optimized. I just put random buildings in random places. So we'll drop some more power stations later and you can show everyone that efficiency mechanic. What are extractors? So extractors are the buildings that pull the resources out of sites. So if you have mm -hmm. a crystal deposit full of silicon, 
you need to build a mine on top of that crystal deposit to be able to extract that silicon. Like right uh, here. So yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a Hyperion extractors extractor. extract resources. They extract resources. Got it. All right. That's pretty straightforward. We don't need to talk about that too much more. That's quite simple. Converters, however, may need some clarification. So why do we need yeah, converters uh, and, and what function do they serve in Alluvium Zero? Converters are probably the most complex and interesting structure we have in the game at the moment. So they have a couple of effects. The first thing that converters do is when they're placed on the land, anywhere on the plot, they start passively grabbing some of the associated resource uh, from the atmosphere or from the, the surrounding terrain. Uh, so you have a condenser plant there on the right. It's passively extracting uh, hydrogen all the time. Um, what converters can also do is convert one element to another element, or if you build a fuel converter, it can convert one fuel type to another fuel type, um, which on the surface seems pretty simple, but it's actually where a lot of the depth of the game comes from. There's, there's a couple of reasons we need to be able to do that. The first is simply, if you happen to have you know, a tier one plot that has three lakes and one Krypton rift, but no other sides, then you don't have a way to extract silicon or a way to extract carbon. I see. But you still need silicon and carbon to build up your structures. So you can use a converter to convert your hydrogen extracted from your lakes into the other elements you need. And the same for Krypton, you can convert your Krypton into Solon and Hyperion. The game is set up so that you can do that fairly efficiently so there's no real penalty for having a tier one that doesn't have all of the different element types for example the the build path it might take a little bit more clicking but the time it takes to get to the end state of the game is still very similar um, but where converters really shine something i find very interesting is in this interplay between the in-game world and the real world markets so you know it, being able to convert one resource to another in a fairly efficient manner means that you've got arbitrage opportunities because I if see. the market price between different fuels, you know, based on the demand of those fuels in the the uh, other games, if those fuels are not equally priced, then there's always that opportunity for you to capitalize in that that small market difference by using your converters and and you know buying in fuel, converting it, and selling it back to the market for a profit so on that's so interesting that's that essentially the video game on top of our video games that macro economy game that is layered on yeah. top of alluvium zero and i think a lot of people interested in land and alluvium zero are going to be interested in that type of thinking and that type of strategy it's deeper than just going click 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 pew 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 your dudes beat up the other dudes this is some this is some deep strategy uh taking a look at markets and considering that and how you're building out your city here yeah, absolutely. I think that, as you say, that interplay, the game on top of the game, is just a really exciting and, and interesting area of Alluvium Zero. That's really cool. I got to ask, uh, and we're seeing some comments and chat about this, Dimitri. Um, as far as all of the buildings and their VFX and everything in the animations here, um, are all of the VFX and animations complete right now? Are you guys still working on those so that uh, everything is as bright and shiny and eye-popping as it could possibly be? Uh, when it comes to things moving about, let's say, on the screen in Alluvium Zero. Well, like, <clears throat> look, as much as people, as much as people love it already, it's not nearly as finished and as polished as we designed to. So there is, there is no current animation imported into the game yet. There is not every single VFX that we planned in is imported into the game yet, but. Basically, we can take it as a bare bones, similar to the Overworld as we launched. Like, you know, we the Overworld isn't polished to the final degree as we want it. And same same applies to the Living Zero. Want the players to have ability to play the game. Everything is there, like from what we did. And from, on top of that, we'll start building all the, improving the quality even more and more. Okay. All right, there's your and answer, everybody. Even better in the future, trust me. 
Got it. With Grant at the helm and Dimitri at the helm, it's never good enough. Triple A is not enough. We need five, six, seven A's in there uh, to get it <laughs> to get it up to the quality level that you guys are looking for. All right, I think that answers some of those questions in chat. Thank you, thank you for that. So let's talk about um, let's talk a little bit more about the elements. So everybody understands, okay, fuel, the uh, resources we're talking about up here, Krypton, Hyperion, and Solon are used uh, and are interoperable with our other games. Help us understand, Johnny, a little bit more about elements specifically. Like, I'm not taking my carbon, and I'm not taking my silicon, and I'm not taking my hydrogen into the overworld, right? No, so at the moment, elements exist solely inside of Alluvium Zero. They're basically the the fundamental building blocks the, the resources required to to build all of these different structures occasionally high level structures will also take a little bit of fuel to build but they'll take very large amounts of, of uh, elements to build as well um, look beyond the alpha we may take these elements to the blockchain as well uh, there's there's no real reason that we couldn't do that uh, and have them tradable and, and so on. Uh, but certainly at the moment and for the foreseeable future, those elements wouldn't be used in, in other games and they're all about building up your structures inside Alluvium Zero. Totally understand that, got it. So I just wanted to clarify that for everybody. The elements are existing within Alluvium Zero. You need to grease up the economy, uh, let's say within this game, and then the fuel and the blueprints will exist outside of this game and be interoperable with our other games. That makes sense. So I obviously this account, Johnny, is loaded up with infinity credits here. I'm, I've got all the cheat codes installed. <laughs> I've got 7,000 credits up here. It's ridiculous. So I can do what with credits? What, what are credits and why do those matter to players in the alpha? So you may have heard at the start of the stream, I mentioned click and wait as a genre of game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pretty common on, on mobile devices where you... You're building up something and as you get uh, more and more advanced things take longer and longer to build uh, sometimes you get sick of waiting and credits are your opportunity to avoid that wait effectively there's a, a cost of one credit equals one hour or an equivalence of one credit equals one hour okay so if you're if you want to fast forward or speed up something that takes 10 hours you can pay 10 credits to have that activity complete um, this is a mechanism to drive revenue generation in the game which then of course like all of our revenue gets distributed to our token holders you can also gain credits in the game by clearing some of the plants and obstacles that grow in your land plot uh, and also by sometimes completing certain goals, you'll be awarded credits as well. One Got it. thing to note, I think it is important to note that you can't use credits to speed up fuel related activities or research related activities. Okay. Uh, and this is because, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the ramifications of requiring credits or to build the optimal fuel generation site, it, it kind of doesn't sit well right where you have to pay to earn uh we'd, we'd much rather people play to earn got it that makes sense and yeah and then people could whale out let's say if they were scanning for bio data and uh whale out yeah. and go acquire um those blueprints uh without having to go through the strategy aspects we talked about earlier to actually achieve that so it kind of in, in some ways it kind of cheapens if you let people pay to get those uh things like research it cheapens the achievement of getting that alluvial. Yeah. And it makes it, it, makes I mean, it less meaningful. Yeah, so there, there is a benefit to using credits, of course. It lets you build up faster uh, so you can get to the, the end game quicker. Um, the alternative, of course, is taking more time, is grinding out more, more time and more actions. Um, but once you get to the end game, it really then becomes about your skill and your knowledge of the game in order to optimize your site and, and make everything as efficient and as productive as possible. Got it. Okay. So, so credits then will, and revenue generated through the credit system will be a part of a revenue, uh, distribution. Got it. All right, cool. Yep. Absolutely. And this, I mean, that's, uh, that's about as standard as you get for city builder games. Want to speed the thing yeah. up, insert the name of the currency for that game. And you can, if you want to pay, or if you want to be patient, you can. 
uh, be patient. It's, uh, it's player choice. It's up to you. Um, okay, that makes sense to me. So let's go ahead and uh, tell everyone in chat that this is your opportunity to ask the developers questions about Alluvium Zero. They're watching chat right now, and they can pull questions that they would like to answer as we see, as they see fit, um, as we move through this. But as you guys are putting your questions down, Johnny, let's talk about advanced strategy. I see your Twitter feed, man. I see you. You're talking about <laughs> efficiency. You're posting pictures of buildings next to each other, and you're like, oh yeah, baby, take a look at that efficiency. What is this efficiency <laughs> mechanic that you're nerding out about here? Tell me about it. I just I just filtered to turn it on and I see 100%, 123. What is this system and why does it matter in Alluvium Zero? So effectively, efficiency is the element of the game that allows the micromanagement, that allows people to really apply their skill and their knowledge to you know, achieve that last sort of 5% or whatever it may be of production. Mm. Um, the basic idea is proximity of different structures affects the efficiency of those structures. The most obvious example, which we talked about a little earlier, is the power station. If you put a power station next to a building uh, that produces fuel or converts fuel or elements, it will make it more efficient. So maybe uh, you see- Ah, got... I see. So this power, so that's why you were talking about building multiple power stations earlier. So everybody watches, yeah, I move absolutely. this power station around, it's impacting the efficiency plus or minus of the buildings around it as you move it around. Interesting. Yeah, so a power station will always make things more efficient or have no effect in some I see, cases. it won't have a negative effect uh, by being further except away. Except for the singularity scanner. So ah, I see singularity that. Singularity scanner is a yeah. building that benefits by being isolated. It's, it's scanning for alluvials, obviously, if you are trying to find creatures, Looking in the middle of the city is not as effective as looking on the outskirts uh, where you don't have any noise or any interference from all of your other structures. But but generally in terms of fuel and conversion, extraction and conversion, uh, plonking a power station next to your structures is the easiest way to get some efficiency boosts. Understood. So this singularity scanner then, once I'm done scanning for bio data here, I, you're telling me I should move this out potential if I wanted to to the corners of the maps so it can have a nice so it can uh, do its business in a nice clean area without interference to increase efficiency yeah absolutely and but that's where the kind of balancing aspect comes in because the more space that you leave for your singularity scanner is the more space that you're not using to generate resources ah. so you have to weigh up the pros and cons you know would I rather get a couple more fuel converters in there. And even though they're maybe not that efficient, I'll extract that last little bit of fuel. Or alternatively, would I rather increase my scanning chances and have more chances of scanning that alluvial biodata? Okay, that makes sense. All right. So right now, as you guys can see, then I'm not being as efficient as I can. And help me then, Johnny. Help me with the random buildings I put in random locations. <laughs> Give me some examples here of things I can do better to be more efficient with my land? Well, I think probably the biggest one jumping out with all these structures sitting everywhere is you've mm -hmm. got a condenser sitting there on the, the bottom right. Uh, so a condenser is a, a structure that passively extracts hydrogen and converts other resources to hydrogen. Yeah. Hydrogen comes from lakes in our game. Mm. So if you move that structure close, you've got two lakes sitting up to the, the top. Oh, right wow. The efficiency increased massively. Lakes, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive increase. Um, now, you also have... Um, what else? That was a great example. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to show a couple yeah. so people can understand that... Uh, yeah, and, I, and the, yeah. The, the fact is it's not simple to find the best structure and the best combinations, and that's... That's what's great about you know the, the fact that we, we took a bit longer to make this a much more complex game than we originally planned. And mm -hmm. you know, thank you, everyone in the community, for bearing with us while we've done this. But there is actually quite a lot of depth to to optimizing your, your plot to really get the most out of it. Why might my anti-Solon inverter and my sad Hyperion Lathe 1 be over here at negative efficient, or not negative, lower than 100% efficiency um, over here, just to give folks an idea of why that might be the case. Yeah, so converters don't start at 100% efficiency. 
Ah. Um, for, uh, and they do need to be either near a power station or near their re associated site, like the lakes we were talking about for the mm -hmm. condenser before, uh, or they won't even be able to get to 100. But the other thing is, as you cram converters close together, so those two structures are quite close together, they have a negative impact on each other. Okay. Particularly if you put you know, two Hyperion lathes next to each other, you'll have a very severe negative effect because they're both trying to extract the same thing from you know, passively from the atmosphere. Uh, but you know, putting any fuel converters next to each other will affect the other converters negatively. Uh, that's a balancing mechanism that we put in place to ensure you don't just completely fill your land with converters and there's no point building anything else because you know, converters can create fuel and you obviously you want to create as much fuel as you can. Uh, so this means that the ideal strategy is not to completely fill your land with converters, but to find a balance between si extractors, converters, um, the power stations, leaving some space for your singularity scanner. And also some paths, which is maybe something we could talk about. Yeah, as well. we've got a ch we've got a question here from KJ in chat. Is there a cost for moving buildings and making paths and changing paths and making those adjustments to to your setup? Uh, do you mind do you mind speaking to those about moving things around and repathing? Let's call it. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something we've sort of flip flopped on a few times, trying to find the right strategy. Um, so currently. In the alpha as it stands, building paths and moving structures have neither a time cost nor a resource cost. Okay. They're totally free. You can do them to your heart's content. You can't move something while it's actively doing something. So if your extractor is extracting um, something from, you know, from a site, maybe you're harvesting some uh, hydrogen from your lake, mm -hmm. you won't be able to move... Uh, well, you can't move sites anyway, sorry. You won't be able to move your converters while they're actively converting or something like that. But other than that, it's free. Now, this is something that we will carefully consider as we move and gather data from the alpha and get to the, the beta. Um, something we've certainly thought about is having some cost in terms of time to move your structures around. Uh, the idea here is that will reward players who know more about the game. So... If you know the details of the game, you can build your structures in the correct positions or the you know, more efficient positions from the start. Um, and then that means you can build up your plot and sell it onto someone else as a, an a efficient plot. For those who don't know the game as well, they will never be stuck. You can always move stuff, but we are thinking about introducing some kind of time cost where maybe it takes five minutes or 15 minutes or something like that to move a building um, absolutely not locked down and this is a really important thing to note the alpha is about gathering data about gathering feedback from the community and making sure that the balance makes sense making sure that the gameplay makes sense and taking in ideas from the community and, and potentially reflecting them in the game before we go out with the open beta so we do in the alpha want uh, balance feedback is what you're saying absolutely um, okay suggestions ideas balance feedback you know we want it all uh, we also will be of course gathering data ourselves and analyzing our data team will analyze that data looking for trends both both positive and negative okay all right that that uh, that really answered that question so help me understand just functionally then what are paths doing other than making your land look cooler um what are they actually doing in terms of uh you know, increasing, decreasing uh, certain aspects of your strategy. Yeah, so because there's a, um, a reason to leave space between buildings, the efficiency system we just talked about, mm -hmm. that opens up the idea of what do we put in that space. And I see. in our case, paths are, are probably the, the, the answer to that question. What, what paths do basically is as a structure becomes more and more surrounded with paths, it becomes faster to build or upgrade that structure. Um, so let's say you know, it might take, if you click on any, any of the structures and press upgrade, it has a time listed, so two days. Um, if you build paths around that, completely around that structure, uh, I think you were on the one to the north there. There we go. 
So if I were to build paths completely around the structure, it would make it so that it would decrease that uh, build time in the future. Or, or be, yeah. the, the upgrade, I'm sorry, the upgrade time in the future is what I meant to say. Yeah. Um, Obviously, I don't know if I could put this one here. Yeah, this, <laughs> My positioning is not optimal, but everyone can imagine yeah. if I knew what I was doing and I, or I, if I was trying to optimize for efficiency, I would be able to surround this building accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the this is another system where this is the first pass. Uh, you know, obviously, it probably makes more sense to connect things with paths rather than just surround them with paths. Right. And that's that's almost something that certainly something that will change by beta, where rather than just getting a, a boost from surrounding it, the boost may be more about what other structures is this structure connected to. So, for example. If you have a path from your structure to the engineering lab, you'll get a boost. But in the alpha, basically each side you surround a structure with uh, gives a boost to the, the upgrade speed. Understood. Okay, thank you for clarifying that about paths. I saw a lot of questions there. There's been a ton of questions in chat and let me know how much we could talk about this, but there is this structure here under the others category. Obviously there was the holographic statue. I've been showing you guys constantly where you can display um, alluvials right here, as you can see. But then there is this, what is this? A marketplace? What does this structure do, Johnny? Um, so in the alpha, the marketplace does nothing um, because the, the alpha doesn't allow transfer of um, resources between um, site so you can't sell and you can't give resources to your other plots and things like that um, but the end state is people are going to be trading these resources both elements and fuel and the marketplace uh, i think we're trying to think of a cool cool name for the the marketplace i think something with uplink in the title aaron was suggesting uh, but basically it's a trading hub right it's a place that will let you buy and sell your uh, resources um as an alternative to using converters and, and whatnot. Understood. Okay. So that helps. So this is going to help players connect to that economic macro game we've been talking about. And of course, Aaron wants to name it something crazy. He can never just call something what it is. It's got to be something. It's got to be something <laughs> weird with Aaron. That's okay. It makes you Illuvium unique uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, naming. Um, okay. All right. Go ahead, Dimitri. Sorry. Okay. Can, can we quickly go uh, ask, uh, like, uh, reply to a couple of other questions? Yes, uh, go for it. Sending, sending some of the fuel. Uh, this will be, again, like a uh, question to Jordi about the mega cities. And as you start mentioning sending some of the fuel between the plots, can we talk about yeah, the mega cities? Yeah, we, well, we can talk about both of those things. So, firstly, mega cities are a feature that's not in the alpha, but anyone who's been following along in the discord channels will know that that's a feature that is planned uh, the basic idea with a mega city is if you have adjacent land that makes certain shapes like a two by two square or a three by three square you can combine them all together into one mega plot or mega city which has much more space the benefits of doing that are, well there's a, there's a couple of them the, the first is any landmark boosts will apply not just to the one plot but to any plot within the mega city so you could have potentially have multiple landmarks impacting all of your plots uh, the second benefit is that by having more space and being able to share structures less of less percentage of your space is taken up with these support structures so you, instead of building four nexuses for four plots you can have one nexus across four plots which actually fills up quite a bit of space that you can use for more productive buildings Interesting. Um, so you can optimize if you have multiple pieces of a land that are adjacent to each other, connected from mega city, then you can optimize each land for one piece of a larger strategy, rather than focusing well, on just making they, one. They will actually play as just one land, effectively. So in in this client, you would just see a much much bigger area. I see. Um, this this the side effect of that is that there's no cost to share resources between your plots because they are just one plot they they there is no um transfer but it is worth pointing out i think i saw some questions about it that um uh, in the 
post alpha or potentially later in the alpha you will be able to send resources between your plots even if they're not connected in a mega city but and the important thing here is there will be a time and resource cost to doing so so you know maybe it will take 24 hours to send 100 kryptons across to one of your plots and it might also cost you one krypton or two kryptons or something like that with a mega city there is no transfer because it's all just treated like one giant plot you want to talk about yeah the ultimate inefficiency is having a mega city i guess that's uh, that makes sense thank you for clarifying that that's why people were freaking out in that original land sale trying to get those adjacent plots there's a question here from my asking does destroying a building i suppose they mean selling a building um uh, return any of the elements or how how uh, i guess my question is how lossy yeah, can, how lossy is that, that? <laughs> uh, if i sell you here can, am i gonna loot it's quite it, lossy it's it, lossy it's quite okay. lossy yeah here it goes um yeah oh. so it's set to 50 <laughs> it's set to 50 percent at the moment that's another balance figure that we might need to tweak as we move okay. through the alpha um but that's really just another one of those things to help ensure you don't get stuck it also lets you change how you've built your plot so if you were focusing originally on lots of singularity scanners and, and materials labs um, some data banks for research then you would maybe want to destroy all of them after you achieved some number of scans and blueprints maybe there was a certain blueprint you were trying so hard to get and you eventually get it you might want to sell some of those research facilities and move back to focusing on on fuel so it's just a way to clear out your plot and as a little added bonus you get currently 50 percent back of what you spent 50 percent back so that is quite lossy but you can do it another part of the strategy it makes sense and in other games like starcraft command and conquer every city builder selling your buildings uh, has to have a consequence or, uh, or it makes it less meaningful to build it in the first place. If you can just instantly vaporize it and get all your resources back, each building doesn't mean as much. Uh, so that makes sense. So I've cheated using the helper menu here, Johnny, for with our singularity scanner. Um, and I'm, it's probably not gonna work, right? But uh, w whenever this is complete, we can click here. Hold on, no alluvials found. So <laughs> obviously in this build, it's difficult to get alluvials. But uh, is this, as a part of your, let's say, blueprint strategy, it's going to be important to continually having this singularity scanner constantly scanning, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really true of, of all structures. There's no reason not to be using the structure all the time. So if you're harvesting, I think your, your token just expired, but it auto logs you in again. Um, but yeah, it's important to be using your your buildings all the time. I see here you've, you've got a fact. So you, um, something, a system we haven't talked about yet is the fact system. Um, spoiler alert, that's that's the first fact that's ever been displayed, I think. Um, World's first here, everybody. Hopefully this yeah. doesn't destroy the lore. Um, <laughs> the for, for Aaron, we're so <laughs> well, sorry, man. <laughs> In 12 hours, all those facts will be discoverable, right? So This is cool. Uh, well, or less than 12 hours, so I think we're good. Um, yeah, so as part of research, you know, we, we talked about you know, being able to find blueprints, which is obviously the main goal of research. But along the way, if your research doesn't discover a blueprint, it still can find out something about the alluvial data that you're, you're looking at. Um, what these facts do beyond just looking cool and telling you more about the law is they also improve your chances of finding blueprints. So if you're researching Tiru and you discover a fact like this, which is uh, a fire affinity, then whenever you research other fire alluvials, you will get a boost to the research. And the more facts you discover, the more of a boost you get. So basically, as you do more research, you discover more facts, and you get better at research. I see. And it snowballs upon itself, building and building also, and building. Like, with, the, with the whole graphic display, is a, if you're displaying one of the alluvial, it it will attract the other biodata to be founded. Yeah, quicker. yeah, absolutely. So look, this is not going to have a market effect in the alpha because there is only a very limited number of alluvials in the alpha, but 
Um, beyond the alpha, when, when all the alluvials are available for scanning, um, the holographic statue, as you're saying, it doesn't just look cool. It doesn't just give you an opportunity to show off. What it also does is increases the chances of finding alluvials with of scanning alluvials with an affinity that matches the ones that you're displaying. So if you had four statues displaying a bunch of uh, fire alluvials and then you start your scan, you're much more likely to scan the data of other fire alluvials. That's Amazing. really cool. So it can, it. it can start to stack and snowball on itself. So that's really, really cool. So it will attract similar alluvials or similar attributes by displaying them here, almost like bait if you will, yeah. on your land. You set <laughs> you set out this alluvial bait and you'll attract more alluvials like it. Very cool. For me, this is one of the most exciting features. I'm ultra zooming in on it. This is one of the most exciting features. I love being able to display your alluvials on your land. And uh, and it's just such a fun feature. I, I want us to implement more stuff like that in the future. I think people, this really doubles down on the collectible aspect of this game and this, this universe. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, we only have five more minutes allotted to show everybody gameplay and to answer questions. So Dimitri and Johnny, um, pull your choice questions from chat and so on. So will I, let's, let's answer what the community would like to know. Yeah, sure. I've got a couple of questions here already. So like, uh, go for it. Sec. Let me just get them in. So what happened, what happened to the plot when it's fully built? Is there a van any value for the elements after that? So absolutely there is. So in order to extract fuel, you need to fuel that extraction with, with other elements. Uh, so if you find one of your um, extractors, Andrew, you can, you can demonstrate that. Uh, yeah, you've, you've got the... Hydrogen uh, pump? Find a... Uh, no, find a fuel-based extractor. Okay, um, you got it. You've got to sort you've got by a resource, one. and let's go find. Yep, I think I have one right down here. Quartz. Here we go. Yeah, there's anti-solon inverter there. There's a uh, solon dredge. Sorry. Um, yeah. So if you press dredge, you'll see up in the top right it costs three hundred thousand silicon to start a dredge action. So. Basically, you know, in the end game, it's really about trying to set up just enough storage so you've got enough storage for your fuel and your elements in order to be able to fuel your fuel generating activities. So you want just enough element generation, just enough storage um, to be able to fuel all of these different actions and you know, kind of optimize for that. So you might build quite a bit more storage in the mid game as you're trying to build up some of these buildings, which are quite expensive. And then once you hit that very end game state, you might actually sell some of those storage structures to make more space for some converters or maybe some more research facilities. Uh, but long story short, yes, elements do have value even in the end game. Uh, not to mention this game will not be released and then left to sit will of course be adding new features new structures more upgrades and so on in an ongoing fashion great question thank but, you and will be there any way to sell the elements uh so right now no but i i did mention earlier in the stream that you know there's, there's certainly talk of making the elements an erc20 token as well and if gotcha. they're an erc20 token then they can be traded uh, and we also have the marketplace again, another feature we talked about where we have the option to to buy and sell things, which will start with fuel, but could also include elements. Sounds good. Question from Nefarious asking what tier of land I, am I playing on? This is a random tier three land on, I'm playing on testnet. So this is tier three. Awesome. Any more questions there, Dimitri? Yeah. And folks, this is your last chance to yeah. ask the Galactic Vice President of Alluvium Zero what you would like to know about this game. There is a couple of other questions regarding the rotation. Like, it, it is a 2D, a 2D game uh, at the end of the day, but like we are planning to have a 90 degree rotation of each building. So you'll be able, because like you see some of the buildings are not just square, but like they do have a different shape and form. So you'll be able to rotate them 
once once it, once it's ready. So that would that would be a rotation then. Uh, you would be able to. So so let me clarify. Your point of view, the point of view I'm using right now, will be locked in yep. in that scenario. Yes. However, you'll be able to click like a rotate button, let's say here on each exactly. building, to change which angle it's facing. Exactly. Yeah. So like you see this uh, this building at the top with the green ring in the center. Like, yes. Uh, to the to the. To this. Higher. Yes, the this, uh, this L Krypton one. Collider. So if you click, uh -huh. Yeah. If you click move. It is a two by three size, and in order, like at the moment, it is locked to that kind of uh, dimensions to this uh, to to this sizing. But like for the for the optimizing purpose, like if you want to rotate it, just this building, it, it is in a perfect spot. But you want to rotate it, you don't have an option at the moment. So in the future, we need to have this option to be able to rotate it 90 degrees, and we're gonna face the other direction, and we'll give you a little bit more space in the, in those two uh, two squares spots. I see. Next so place. not only would this be an aesthetic change, but this would also change your some strategic considerations in terms of the positioning of your land, because, yeah. or positioning yeah. of the buildings on your land, because Johnny mentioned, and it sounds like end game, if you will, here on land, is you're running out of space on your land <laughs> at the end game. And so if you can rotate, that gives players more choices to better optimize for end game. Yeah, absolutely. You know, effectively allowing you to squeeze it tighter into certain spaces. Maybe your sites are in a certain place. You can't move your sites. So being able to rotate might allow you to get a little bit closer to the associated site, give you that little bit extra efficiency boost or whatever it may be. Very cool. Any more questions, Dimitri? Uh, there is a couple of questions regarding the credit cost. Do we do we have any information on that, or do we just keep it? Keep yep. It so, now? so one. Oh, sorry. You mean I thought you meant per hour. Um, no, the, no. The, the prices haven't been set. I mean, like anything, the plan is that they will be purchasable with SILV with ETH, and also for mobile devices through the associated app stores. Mm -hmm. uh, but pricing hasn't been set at this point. Yeah, we're not at that point right now with Alluvium Zero. We need people to get in here and test it, change the balance, <laughs> and like get the basic balance testing and what have you done with actual real humans using the land and playing the game. Pricing would be well, like I, a, later on. What's that? I bet Kieran is already. I bet Kieran is already ready to purchase some of the credits. He ran out of them very quick. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No doubt, <laughs> he's gonna wail out. That's his style right there. He says he's going to be patient, and then boom, the FOMO kicks in. He's going to start wailing out. That's awesome. All right, guys. Um, any final questions? Otherwise, I think we're going to end the stream there. No, I think we're good. Uh, I do want to answer this one. There's one here from Hans, and maybe it's a repeat, but what will happen to the structures if we sell the land? So let's say Hans, in this example, has a tier three land just like me. He doesn't randomly place buildings. He optimizes it and he wants to sell it. Are all the structures going to be in the exact same spot? Is it going to be in the same state if he decides to sell it on the Aluvidex in this hypothetical, Johnny? Uh, for Alpha, no. But absolutely long term for the open beta, uh, the buildings will persist. So the structures will persist. And that's a really important sort of part of the game because it allows you know maybe those who don't have so much free cash to build up a land and then maybe they optimize it get it perfect and sell it on to someone who doesn't want to spend that time but is willing to pay a premium for a pre-built optimized land makes sense all right dimitri any final thoughts on alluvium zero anything else anything else you'd like to say uh from the creative side of of create of making this game we are really happy at the way it looks and we can't wait for you guys to give it a go break it if it's possible and <laughs> leave us a feedback break it baby i love it johnny <laughs> final thoughts are yours and then we'll end the live stream look i think i want to thank everyone in the community particularly those who purchase land for for bearing with us the the when land uh, comments have been frequent but but also deserved. I mean, we, we certainly took a lot longer than, than we planned. Hopefully you enjoy this end result, uh, which is really not the end result, but just a step along the journey. Do keep in mind that it is an alpha. 
Uh, we, we labeled it that way very specifically because we are expecting some bugs and balance issues. Please give your feedback, please report bugs. Uh, and most of all, enjoy. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you, Johnny, appreciate it. Thank you all for watching and for um, exploring Alluvium Zero and learning a bit more about land. Just wanna be clear, nothing we said in the stream is financial advice. We're talking about a cool video game that we're making and innovating by making Alluvium Zero interoperable with our other games, Overworld and Arena. And we're excited to see how this plays out. And we're excited to see all of you test Alluvium Zero Alpha and give us that feedback like Johnny mentioned before. Thanks for your time and attention, and we'll see you in the next episode of Alluvium Insider. Enjoy this awkward transition out as I end the live stream. <laughs> see you all. <laughs> see you all later. <laughs> Bye. All right, perfect. Let me press the button here. You guys can still.